Hey everyone, I'm Paul Moore with Wellings Capital and Bigger Pockets, and I am so happy and honored to be here with you. I don't know what the weather is like where you are, but it's 75 and sunny in Central Virginia today. So hopefully you're having a great Saturday and a great weekend. Hello, Lori from Tampa. Hey, Mike from Naples. Hey, Angel, how are you? So I am. Um, I'd love to hear where you're from. Love to hear what you're up to, what you're doing in the uh, real estate investing world, what you wanna do, what are your hopes, what your dreams are. I've been encouraging people to that uh, this is the time to get ready. Chris from Lynchburg, my hometown. Um, I've been encouraging people to get ready and prepare yourself. Don't waste this time by re-watching uh, you know, binge watching Game of Thrones. This is the time to get ready. Today, we're going to talk about crisis investing 101, how to navigate real estate investing in uncertain times. Hey, Jorge from Long Island, James from Gainesville, Virginia, Joshua from Afghanistan, usually from Central Arkansas. So great to see all of you, YouTube, Facebook. We're so happy to be here. So I'm going to quickly jump into some content here. And then we're going to go to Q&A. So um, if you can save your questions, I won't even see them if they're in the next 15 or so minutes. Uh, but I'm going to jump into some uh, content about real estate investing in uncertain times. The main thing I want to say today is, again, I want to re-emphasize. This is the time to prepare. This is the time to do what you always want to do. This is the time to pivot. If you've been slogging away, dreaming or wishing to get into real estate, this is the time to prepare. Real estate is great because of its fragmented market and the lagging nature of real estate prices. You know, you can lose 10 or 20% of your portfolio in a day or two or even over lunch while you take a break if you're in the stock market. But real estate has a very, very slow reaction time, especially non publicly traded real estate, which is what we're mostly all about here at Bigger Pockets. So I would recommend that you prepare for what could be the greatest buying opportunity of your lifetime. You know, Ken McElroy and Howard Marks are two really smart guys. Ken is, he bought a billion dollars worth of apartments and other assets in the middle of the great uh, financial crisis about 10 years ago. Well, he is preparing again. And he says the buying opportunities are going to be one to two years from now. That may make you sad because you're ready to buy today, but that'll give you a chance to assemble your tribe, assemble your team, get the knowledge you need to um, invest in real estate in a really, really smart way. You know, Howard Marks wrote Mastering the Market Cycle and the most important thing, he is the greatest buyer of distressed debt uh, in America. And he is pulling together. He said he'd hoped he'd never have to do it again after 2008, but he's now pulling together by far the largest distressed debt fund ever. He's a smart guy. He knows what's coming. I want to make sure you know what's coming as well. So my daughter, Mary, uh, drew this and we use some color enhancement. Never let a good crisis go to waste says Winston Churchill. So we're not going to let it go to waste either, right? Bigger pockets, friends. So this is the fear and greed index. We check it every week. Look at that. January 17th, it was almost as high as it could possibly go. Extreme greed. And greed means, you know, the the, the buying, the, the sense that people want to buy whatever they can get their hands on, even if they have to overpay. Look at that. Just five or six weeks later, it was down to six or seven weeks later, down to six, the lowest I've ever seen it. And now uh, last week it was at 39. And this week it's up to 42. So there must be some good news, at least in the realist, at least in the stock market. Now, real estate investors don't, uh, they don't go on whims like this. They don't buy based on momentary fear and greed. You know, in the stock market, things can change in minutes. Uh, I heard a funny story this week about all the reasons people were changing their mind uh, and, and literally buying and selling stocks on a dime. We don't do that. We've got a longer term view. And speaking of longer term view, today I'm going to go over 
some information put out by Green Street today. Now, Green Street uh, is one of the best um, uh, analysts of real estate um, in uh, the world, and they did a great webinar earlier this week. You can find it. Um, but if you're going to screenshot anything, this would be what I would screenshot. This is a graph. If you look to the right on the X axis, that's economic sensitivity. That's these different asset classes, how sensitive they are in general to economic ups and downs. And then the Y axis, the vertical axis is the COVID-19 sensitivity. And so the goal would be um, as far as risk, not as far as return, but the goal would be on, on the risk uh, penchant to be as far to the left and as far down as possible. So medical office is the winner on this one, followed closely by cell towers, uh, self-storage and manufactured housing, which is mobile home parks, data centers, single family residential. That's good news for a lot of you, uh, Is are some of the winners on this. The big loser by far is obviously lodging as high and far to the right as you can get. Uh, and we've seen a lot of tragic stuff happening in, in the hotel, in the corporate rentals and Airbnbs, which I've been a big fan of for a long time. Gaming, strip centers, malls, you know, some of them are already suffering. And we're going to see today that they're going to have even a harder time in the coming months. Now, this is, don't worry, investors, this is only a measurement of the publicly traded REITs results since February 21st, when things started going south in the stock market. You can see data centers are the big winner here. Cell towers are up a little bit. Life science, industrial, self-storage, manufactured homes, single family rentals um, were all in the publicly traded realm, uh, the relative winners in this. Um, malls were obviously the biggest loser, loser, and they've got healthcare down there as a big loser as well. I know that there's a lot of reasons for that, and I think you can think through why healthcare might not be doing as well as you would think. That seems kind of in contrast to the previous screen that where medical offices were the lowest risk. Healthcare, of course, includes hospitals, and they've really had a hard time during this. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to very briefly go through these asset classes with a quick analysis on each one. If you want a more detailed analysis, I'm going to be writing a blog on this in the next one to two weeks in bigger pockets. So let's look at apartments first. Uh, lower right graph is the one I want to point to. The original net operating income forecast growth would have it going from 100 that's the baseline in 2019, to 107 in three years. That's 2022. But it's actually now forecasted to be down at 92. So that is 15 percentage points below what was originally expected. All because somebody ate a bat in a market in China? Well, even if that's not the reason, if it was made in some lab, it's, it's amazing to think that things could be this sensitive. Now, the problem I have, and I'm going to spend a moment on apartments because I did a little analysis the other day. You all know that the value of commercial real estate that's, you know, larger than four unit apartments, let's say a five unit, 80 unit, 200 unit, the value is based on a formula. And that formula is the value equals the net operating income divided by the rate of return or the cap rate. Now, I did a little analysis the other day and I said, okay, what if, uh, what if net operating income does drop 15%? And what if cap rates expand? That means the prices are getting lower based on the market. What if the cap rate expands 1% from, let's say, 5.5% to 6.5%? And that's very, very reasonable and realistic that it'll expand at least 1%. The combination of that 15% lower net income and the 1% cap rate expansion in that formula is going to be a 28% degrading of the value of an apartment. Well, if you go down 28% and you're leveraged already at 75%, that's the current loan to value ratio. Um, hopefully you're not there, but that means you're underwater because the value of your apartment is now at 72% of what it would have been 
and your loan is at 75% of what it would have been. And so this is a very serious situation. And I'm going to point out in as strong of terms as I can that this also is an opportunity for many of you. Because if that's the average of what's going to happen, and there's no guarantee it is, certainly every forecast is wrong. The question is by how much. But if that is what is going to happen, there's going to be some apartments on the market from banks, some banks who want to sell these notes or want to or have to take these back. And they're going to be available at a deep discount to you. And that's why I'm saying, Bigger Pockets friends, it is time to assemble your team, assemble your tribe, and be ready. You might be able to buy some of these apartments at 40, 50, or 60 cents on the dollar. And um, I'm fully intending on taking actions in that regard. Who's with me? All right. So, next, this is great news single family rentals. There's a lot of reasons these are doing as well as they are. You can see that. Uh, in the bottom right corner, they've actually transposed apartments going down to 92% versus single family rentals actually doing very well. It looks like they're flat from last year to this year, and then they're going to go up by 6%. And there's it's really easy to figure out why. There's a lot of individuals and families who want to rent a single family home. Their credit, let's just say their credit gets smashed through this COVID crisis and the ripples that come after that, they really want to live in the same school district they were before. Now their credit's destroyed, their down payment for the home has evaporated, and banks have tightened up on their lending requirements. Three bad things that happen all at once, but they really want to live in that school district. They have very few homes to choose from. I mean, there's probably going to be apartments galore available there, but they want to live in a home. Maybe even the COVID fears have made them want to spread out a little bit. They're determined to rent a house. And if you've got a house, a single family rental in that school district, in that area, it could be a great opportunity for you. So single family rentals makes total sense to me, by the way. Um, the disadvantages are, you know, it's hard to get scale, large scale. But if you're looking to buy one or two or three single family rentals, my opinion would be to wait one year, and then I would use the Chris Prefontaine method of buying, uh, assigning, uh, excuse me, uh, subject to mortgages or lease options or lease option sandwiches. And if anybody asks me about that later, uh, we will try to get to your question. So that's where I want to spend the most time. I'm going to quickly flip through these. Office sector, uh, they're, they're proposing a 3.6% down this year and then an uh, increase, a uh, total net increase of 2% over 2019 up to 2022. I don't actually believe this. And I just have a sense that, you know, Morgan Stanley's CEO just came out on April 17th, I think. And he said, hey, we've learned we can work from home. We're going to be working from home a lot more. I think there's going to be a lot more pain in the office sector than this is showing, but they're smart guys. Lodging. Oh, this is painful. Now, this is only a one-year look out to February 2021, and um, this is uh, based on RevPAR. Now, RevPAR is the revenue per average hotel room, and so if you have 100 rooms in a hotel, only 10 are being rented at $100 each. The revenue per average room, if I did my math right, is um, the revenue per average room would be $10 because there's only 10% of them rented at $100. That's how you do the math on that. Remains to be seen. Um, my friends in Airbnb and corporate rentals, which I've been recommending here for a long time, are really feeling the hurt right now, and I'm feeling the pain with them. Reduced healthcare forecasts. Okay, so this are, these are the publicly traded healthcare companies. Um, you know, groups like HTA, et cetera, um, there, uh, you can see that they're showing a, a pretty big dip in 2020, but a recovery starting in 2021, uh, retail. Now retail has had serious headwinds already going into this crisis. Uh, I think I read 12,000 retail outlets were closed in 2019 in one of the most booming com economies in American history. So um, retail is suffering and a lot of big box retail, 
uh, I, I should say Neiman Marcus, J.C. Penney are already rumored to follow Sears and uh, Kmart into bankruptcy soon. Uh, and it's going to have a devastating effect on a lot of other retail. Um, there are uh, grocery anchored uh, strip centers that are actually doing really badly right now because grocery stores are doing great, but all the other small businesses like hair salons, nail salons, et cetera, are really struggling. Uh, now the power centers that have like a Target, uh, Office Max, and um, uh, Best Buy, those power centers are actually doing, uh, they're predicted to do a little better in the coming months. This could be a cre great time for some of you creative bigger pockets folks to figure out a way to repurpose retail and malls and things like that. Net lease, triple net lease, um, the uh, overall, they're, uh, they're a mix, you know, malls and strip centers not doing so well. Uh, industrial doing surprisingly well. Data centers should be doing very, very well, as you can imagine. Now, data centers, we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. Self-storage. Self-storage. Now, the publicly traded REITs are showing a 12% uh, down, which is far better than the malls lodging strip centers net you know a lot even the net lease which are 32 percent down right now but um the privately held good operators i think are, are actually i've talked to a whole bunch of them in the last six weeks they're doing very very well right now especially those self-storage facilities that have automated check-in and check-out um and you know good websites where you can actually lease a unit they're actually doing quite well I've heard that the uh, the um, um, not suburban, but the uh, really um, the way out there, small self storage facilities out in the country um, are in the rural. That's what I was looking for. The rural were what was I thinking, Elaine? Um, rural uh, are not doing well at all right now. So if you want to get into self storage, plan to automate all you can. Um, industrial. For some reason, which is hard to understand, the larger average square footage, uh, square feet of uh, rentals, industrials are doing better than the smaller ones. So um, industrials plan uh, is predicted, especially warehousing and logistics with all that's going on with Amazon and the world going away from uh, local stores to e-commerce, uh, doing very well right now, as you can imagine. Uh, data centers and cell towers are lumped together. And I think, you know, overall, they, you know, even if the publicly traded ones aren't doing so well, overall, these should be doing uh, best. You can imagine that so much usage has been, uh, so there's been so much demand in these areas, uh, especially recently. Now, these were already the opposite of retail. They're already on a good trend. They're already getting better. They're already... Uh, pushing forward in demographics and demand. I will say the one thing that is a negative for data centers right now is the uh, users of data centers are getting more and more bargaining power because they're renting larger spaces. And so the gross revenue is increasing for data centers, but the net profit is slightly down uh, because the cost, the rental rates per square foot are slightly down. So, like I said, a lot of people think of this Winston Churchill quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. They think of that as a terrible thing. And it is a terrible thing when bad people in bad governments take advantage of these type of situations. But this is also, uh, the flip side of that coin is this is an opportunity of a lifetime for you. If you haven't watched Ken McElroy's 19-minute uh, video on COVID, it's M-C-E-L-R-O-Y. He's a friend of Bigger Pockets. He has done some great uh, stuff on this COVID crisis and how you can make sure not to let a good crisis go to waste. So Nikki, our producer, I want to, my hat's on off to you. And I want to thank you for letting me do these slides. We're going to flip back to Q&A right now. So um, I, uh, again, I'm honored to be here. We uh, are, Bigger Pockets has a new book out by Brian Burke. 
and it's called the Hands Off Investor. And I can't wait to get my hands on it. I actually ordered it uh, yesterday and I'm looking forward to getting uh, my own copy. And I've written a book on self storage and that should be out sometime this summer. So Sadat, hey Sadat, welcome to the show. Toronto real estate market is not declining, why? Okay, so I talked to a guy, I talked to two separate people in Idaho this week and they said their economy is so strong and there are so many positive factors going on that they don't expect, they're not seeing a decline, they're not expecting a decline. I don't know. Does anybody else have an answer for that? Uh, I think it's really um, great it, that we're a community here and there are so many people here that know so much that I don't know. So for my first answer for the day, I'm going to say I don't know, but I'd like to know why Toronto's not declining. Now, if you're a real estate investor, don't fear decline because that's your opportunity to jump in and buy at a bargain basement price. Florida had some condos that started at 100,000, let's say in 99, that went up to like 250,000 by 2007. Then they dropped to 48,000. I saw one uh, during the crisis, uh, the 2009 crisis, and now they're back in the mid 200s. Well, guess what? If they drop again below 100, do you think it might be a good time to buy? I think it might be. If there's not opportunities like that in Toronto, I'd recommend going somewhere else. So Peggy says lease option sandwich. So I could spend the rest of the day talking about lease option sandwiches. Peggy, thanks for joining us. Cool outfit, motorcycle. Um, so um, I, I, I wanna recommend in the strongest terms that you learn about this. Now, one place to learn about it is my friend, Chris Prefontaine. He's a writer for Bigger Pockets. He's got a book I just finished reading called Real Estate on Your Terms, Your Terms, and he's got a course as well. A lease option sandwich is when you go to a distressed seller and you can acquire their home subject to the original mortgage, meaning you're leaving the original mortgage on it, their mortgage stays in place, you put it in a land trust or you possibly just rent to own it from them, you have the now the option to buy it, you start making their mortgage payment then you go out and mark it up. You go out, maybe you clean the house out. They move They move out, you clean it up. You might give it a little fresh coat of paint, change the shrubbery out front, paint the door. I'm thinking of a real example when we did this in Roanoke, Virginia. And then you find a buyer, somebody on the other side who really wants to rent, who really wants a single family rental with the option to buy. They'll come in with a maybe five or $10,000 down payment or deposit. They give you that, that's your first payday of three, and then they pay you a slightly or maybe somewhat inflated amount over the monthly mortgage. So they pay you, let's say you're paying 900 a month in rent, actually that's mortgage to the original mortgage. You're collecting, let's say 1200 a month, that's a $300 a month profit in your pocket, that's your second of three paydays. And then if they close on it, and most don't, but if they close on it in, let's say, two, three, four years after they've got their credit repaired, then they pay you the difference of the original agreed upon sales price less whatever credits you've given them, which would be the down payment and maybe a little bit of monthly credit, minus the original uh, mortgage payoff. That difference is your third payday, and that's often quite large can often be thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars or more. And if they don't close, and most don't, they quietly move out. They usually don't trash the place because they were on a rent to own. And then you go in, do a little repair or fix up if needed, and you do it again. This is a phenomenal way to control real estate without a huge amount of money, if any, out of your pocket. And it's my favorite strategy right now for newbies, or people who really want to jump into residential real estate. Hey, I'm not a newbie and I plan to do it in Florida um, uh, when this thing hits bottom in a couple years. So Tim Henderson from Northern Virginia. Hey Tim, regarding mobile home parks in general, why invest in these over other asset types? Great question. Tim actually is, uh, he uh, grew up down the road from me in Roanoke, Virginia and I know Tim. So um, mobile home parks are the bottom rung on the housing class. And uh, 
the that means that if people are downsizing in the recession or depression down from uh, a home to an apartment or from an apartment or small home down to somewhere else mobile homes are the bottom rung and that's you know below mobile home parks if you can't afford a $300 lot rent uh plus the small cost of a trailer or trailer rent then you're likely going to be living under a bridge it's the only asset class that has a shrinking supply and an increasing demand every year. 10,000 people turn 65 every day, but 60%, six out of 10 of those 10,000 per day have less than 10,000 saved for retirement. And this is an amazing thing. And so something that, you know, I hope none of you ever face that, but uh, this is a perfect situation. A lot of them do have some home equity they can trade in. A lot of them will do that and buy uh, an, a mobile home on, in a mobile home park and now have very low lot rent, low maintenance, flexibility to travel, et cetera. So a uh, Princeton study actually said if that mobile home park lot rents are only have only gone up 50% as much as other real estate in the last 50 years. So mobile home lot rents are behind, which means there's often some room to go up and you know me well enough i hope to know i'm not saying gouge anybody but i am saying you know that there is some room for increase so and by the way tim henderson is actually a real estate broker and he actually has some mobile home parks some very small to mid-sized mobile home parks if you're looking for a mobile home park um, tim henderson you should pm him here on bigger pockets um, and you can learn more about that. So Robert and, and Tim and I had talked about it this week briefly. Tim, um, uh, Robert Freeborn. Hey, Robert, do you recommend taking any good deals we see now for flipping or wait, waiting for X amount of time till things crash further? You know, Robert, um, that's a hard one. Um, I think that if you can get a 10 or 20 or 30% discount right now, and you believe what I said 15 minutes ago about single family rentals being good, and you want to rent, I would say go for it. If you want to flip, you're buying in a very uncertain time. You're trying to do what's called catching a falling knife. Now, if you drop a knife from above your head, to the floor and you want to go pick it up almost anybody from you know older than a toddler can safely pick that knife up off the floor but if you're trying to catch it while it's falling well that could be pretty dangerous and i think that's what you're doing by buying now unless you're absolutely certain you're getting a fantastic deal that said i will tell you that my company is investing right now we are buying deals that we think are fantastic and recession resistant asset types specifically self storage mobile home parks, but like with apartments, we're waiting. We're going to wait one to two years and try to buy some back from the bank. And we don't want to see anybody fail, but the economic cycle automatically produces people who succeed and people who fail. And I want all of you to be among those who succeed. So I've got Dude Real Estate on here. Uh, uh, if you guys have a question that I don't get to, Nate Shields is another writer for Bigger Pockets, and he's kind enough to join us today. He's answering questions on the YouTube side. So Dude Real Estate is a coach, trainer, real estate investor. He can help you as well. The Occult Network, thank you for joining us. Zoso is multifamily apartment buildings. In case you thought I was just saying a random weird word, that's the symbol there that Led Zeppelin has used a lot. It's also the symbol of the Trinity. And so is multifamily apartment buildings a good investment right now? Will banks lend on those properties? Banks are tightening up. Um, I think it's going to be very, very challenging right now. Um, the larger the bank and the more uh, agency debt you're looking at, which would be like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, there is a real possibility that uh, they are going to um, want you to put 12 to 18 months of principal and interest payments in a bank account. Can you imagine that? So if you're buying a multi-million dollar apartment, you might have to leave, let's say, a million dollars sitting idle 
just earning interest in a, a low interest bearing bank account. That's rough. Now, if you go uh, to a local bank, a community bank, a regional bank, a credit union, you're less likely to get hit with those requirements. So yes, um, you can buy multifamily right now. Yes, you can get it funded. I think that if you have the patience to conserve dry powder and hold on for you know another one to two years, you're going to get far, far better deals. That's my prediction. Ken McElroy, like I said, he bought a billion dollars of apartments and other assets in the past, and he says the same thing. So James McAndrew, hey, James from Gainesville, Virginia, do you see cap rates for self-storage facilities rising or compressing in the near future? specifically rural mom and pop facilities. So um, so cap rate expansion means that people are, are demanding a higher rate of return. In other words, their risk premium, their, their desire to risk is going down, their desire for safety is going up, and I think that's exactly what's going to happen. I'm, I'm sure we've already seen cap rate expansion just in these two months since this emergency started. Uh, specifically rural mom and pop facilities. I think there's going to be even more cap rate expansion in rural or overbuilt areas. You know, self-storage um, is my favorite or equal to my favorite asset class. And I think that self-storage is going to experience some, it has experienced some overbuilding and it has experienced in certain micro economies, certain geographies, uh, there are uh, the, those assets are overbuilt. So I think you're going to see problems in those areas like Boise, Idaho. I, I just heard yesterday about a facility that has 250,000 square feet. That's like five times the average facility out there. And um, there are virtually empty because there are too many self-storage facilities built there. I can tell you Nashville's overbuilt, but I can tell you parts of Nashville like Bellevue and Bell... Um, uh, the South Side, Belmont, uh, are underbuilt. In fact, there is a need for more self-storage. So um, anyway, uh, I would say self-storage, just like other asset classes, is going to experience uh, expanding cap rates during this environment, but probably much less than others. Uh, by the way, James McAndrew, who asked that question, is actually a friend of mine as well. And he is dealing in self-storage facilities. So if you're looking to buy a small self-storage facility, you can check in with James McAndrew. Henry Lang says, are you tracking any financial or economic indicators like unemployment claims to track the housing market? Yes. Meaning trying to determine when that dropping knife is going to go back up. So folks, in 19... 70s in stagflation, there were 2.2 million people unemployed. In the first uh, 1980 recession, in 1980, uh, with the Fed crisis, there were 2.5 million people unemployed. Uh, in the second dip of that double dip recession in 82, there were about 2.3 million people unemployed. In the 2001 crisis, 1.9 million unemployed. And in 2009 crisis, I believe there were 2.6 million people unemployed. My friends, we just experienced 22 million unemployment claims and they're still coming in. That's like 10 times the norm. Don't tell me this is going to be over quickly. I'm sorry. I want to be an optimist. I am an optimist, right, Hannah? I'm an optimist. But I really believe the facts. I'd rather be a realist here. And the facts are telling me that this is going to take a long time to fix. And so, Henry, I think, again, that if you look through history, study Howard Mark's book, The um, uh, Mastering the Market Cycle, look at what's happened in past recessions, look at the devastation from these unemployment claims. You're going to see this is going to this, this be the opportunity of a lifetime for you, my friends. It really is. And I'm sorry for all the people who are going to be hurt. I'm sure all of us are going to be hurt in some ways. But the question is, what are we going to do with the time that we have? You know, like uh, Gandalf told Frodo, no one wishes for these times. But what are you going to do with the time that you have? Use it wisely. 
look back on this time as the turning point where you actually jumped in with both feet. You assembled your team, you got your tribe, and you made a run for this because tough times are here right now and it's going to be a good time for you to take advantage of what's going on. And I'm not saying take advantage of anybody. I mean, let's go back to my lease option sandwich thing real quick. Who wins? The bank wins. They don't get a house in distress back. The seller wins because they couldn't sell the house, but now you're buying it from them. The buyer wins, the tenant buyer, because they get to lease with the option to buy and you win and your family wins because you made a profit doing it. There are no losers. I defy anyone to tell me who the loser is in that. You can be that person. You can help people. You can share you can share your love and your kindness with others and make a profit in the meantime. So EL, thank you for joining us EL. Investing in notes is a good idea right now. What's your thoughts? This is the best time possibly in history according to Howard Marks who's the expert in investing in notes and also Dave Steck S T E C H to invest in notes. Uh, and I don't mean today. I mean, it's time to prepare to invest in distressed debt. Do I have a slide, Nikki? Um, I think I might have a slide on this, but I can't find it right now. But there is going to be incredible um, opportunities to invest in distressed debt. Let me just quickly pull up the slide. Our amazing producer, Nikki is going to help me pull this slide up. So this slide shows the Green Street Commercial Property Index. And um, <clears throat> this, these are some of, you know, this is what's happened over the last five or six years before the crisis. Now, you can see manufactured housing is at the top, by the way. That's mobile home parks. Self-storage uh, is real high as well. Industrial is high. Apartments have done well. Look for assets that are already on the increase. <clears throat> I mean, let's look at malls. There are negative 20% before this crisis. And by the way, I believe this crisis is only going to accelerate what was already happening. So if you're like manufactured housing at the top of this list, you're likely going to be doing better after this COVID crisis. And I can give you an hour long exhortation on why I think that is. If you're in malls, you're probably going to be accelerating your death spiral. So my friends, I think it's time, you know, my friend Chad Corbett, bigger pockets guy, and um, he's the CEO of all the leads. They provide leads for people wanting to buy single family homes, etc. cetera. Uh, Chad says it's time to start repurposing malls. It's time to actually find a way to do something else with malls, perhaps.
Hey, I am back and I apologize for that little glitch. You can thank Chantel, my internet provider for that little glitch. If it happened once, it might happen again. So Nikki, do we have any more questions? Uh, I am back alive in the flesh and hoping to get a few more questions here. So Magic Turtle says, would you overpay slightly for the safety of tenants applying? Can you, Magic Turtle, that's a great name, uh, and I'm trying to figure out what you mean. So would I overpay slightly for the safety of tenants applying? How important is uh, location when buying homes? So, you know, they say location, location, location. It's absolutely true. Um, I think location is really important. I don't totally understand your earlier question, so I apologize. Um, but uh, I think that uh, location is going to be as important as ever in this time. And so uh, I am very sorry that I cut out. Hope you're still here with me. If you're here with me, say hi. Hey, Sue P. Okay, Sean Coran says, guys, I really wanted to hear what examples he was going to give of repurposed malls. Ha ha. Okay. So Sean, um, if I'm reading, please repeat. Um, so repurposed mall. So a friend of mine, AJ Osborne, he was on the July 4th, 2018, easy to remember date. I'm not that smart, uh, episode of a bigger pockets podcast. And, uh, he actually repurposed a super Kmart to be a massive self-storage project. Get this. He had two and a half million cash in it. 5 million in debt, so 7.5 million total after selling off the parking lot to an apartment developer. And now he cut the Kmart in half. He made more self-storage, indoor, outdoor. It was perfectly set up, perfect location. He turned down $25 million offer for that. He actually refinanced it, refinanced all their cash out, and they are in the money, Sean Karan. And so... Corun, sorry. And um, I'm hoping that you can find a creative way to repurpose a mall as well. My friend Chad Corbett says that a way to do that is by making malls into senior living spaces. Now, that takes a lot of vision. Chad's a smart guy. He's the head of all the leads. And you can check in uh, with Chad Corbett if you have an interest in talking about repurposing malls. So uh, Shelly Toom says, we have an opportunity to buy a duplex with seller carrying the note. Started talking on this in January. So things have changed as we are concerned about the price. Market is San Diego, California. Shelly, you know, San Diego has had some big ups and downs. And it's one of the sand states, which is California, uh, Arizona, Nevada, and Florida. And I don't know if I have time to pull up a uh, graph of the sand states' uh, real estate prices, but they are uh, they they are quite they are quite up and down. Uh, look at this um, if you can pull that up there. I don't know if you still can, but if you can see that graph, um, they go up and down significantly. San Diego is not exempt. And I would say, Shelly, if you agreed on a price in January in San Diego, you may, if you can honorably do so, wait and look at doing that at another time. I think it's pretty likely prices will go down in this coming environment. What do you think, dude, real estate about that? That's Nate Shields. Christine A says, I'm saving on my first investment property and I have to put 20% down, but I can't decide. Should I first start with a single family home or buy land and do a mobile home park? Okay. I can confidently tell you, Christina, uh, I've studied this pretty carefully. I would not buy land and start a brand new mobile home park. For time's sake, since we have 15 minutes left, I won't tell you the long list of reasons. I'll just tell you it's extremely hard to start a brand new mobile home park and make it profitable. It could take you 20 years 
to fill it up. And honestly, um, I would consider buying an existing small mobile home park all day long and then growing it slowly. Yes. Improving it. Yes. Single family homes. You know, if you were here about 10 minutes into my uh, presentation today, you'll see that single family homes are predicted to do quite well. And so that is an option as well. Verna Littleton. Hey, Verna, Paul, do you see foresee there being a lot of short sales on single family homes in addition to foreclosures? Yes. There were a lot of short sales last time. Right now, I've been talking about assembling your tribe, assembling your team, getting ready. Part of that is getting to know bankers. And so I highly recommend that you get to know bankers in this process, get to know the REO, real estate owned departments, and get ready to be there to help with a short sale because there are going to be a lot of them, I'm afraid. And so thank you for your question. Marcelo Santana says, real estate in Orlando, Florida is still hot. When should we see prices going down? Vacation homes are on a halt. How bad can that get with Disney and other parks closed? Marcelo, I think it could get really, really bad. And I just heard that Disney plans to be closed for quite a while. Um, whether that's true or not, I think that Florida is going to take a huge hit. And I think Orlando, you know, even, even if it's still hot right now, um, it doesn't mean it will be uh, uh, actually Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, others are already predicting a real difficulty with mobile home parks, excuse me, mobile home parks, with Orlando specifically. In fact, all of Florida has potential difficulties, but Orlando specifically is likely going to have some problems. I tried to pull up that um, uh, graph earlier. Nikki, if you can show the graph here. Now, this is the Case Schiller Home Price Index. And um, this, you can see, you can't see all of this real well here, but you can see that, um, you know, there are, you know, some markets, this 10 city composite, for example, has higher ups and higher downs than others. There are other graphs I could show you, but I mean, remember if you can try, we're somewhere, I don't know if you can see my mouse, probably not, but we're somewhere in here, just going over the top of the roller coaster before that gray bar. If you can wait, you can see, by the way, from this, that it takes years to get to the bottom, literally years. And so don't expect big pricing changes in months it's going to take years and i would predict one to two years in this situation okay thanks nikki so the next question was how do i invest in distressed debt so nick what you could possibly do is go to a bank like here let's do the math on this let's say there's a four million dollar apartment complex it was overpriced in 2017 18 19 when it was purchased for four million it was purchased with 75% uh, debt, so $3 million in debt. Now it suffers over the next couple of years, and it's up for refinance. That's one of the most beautiful things about commercial real estate and the toughest things and is that they always have to be refinanced. It's not like a 30-year single-family loan. Commercial real estate has to be refinanced sometimes in three years for bridge loans, five, seven, 10, or 12 years. Um, well, if somebody's coming up for refinance and the value – of their apartment building has dropped from 4 million to 3 million and they still have to they have to refinance 3 million and they're behind on payments that bank's not going to refinance them they're going to be hard pressed to find anybody to refinance them and they're going to have to find equity to fill those gaps well if they can't find equity and their credit score is shot it's likely they're going to lose that so you can go to a bank and say hey do you have a $3 million note on a previously $4 million apartment you'd sell me? And the bank might be willing to unload it for 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar. So let's say they would sell you that note of 3 million for 1.5 million. And by the way, it doesn't have to be on this large a scale. This could be on a $100,000 scale. So you buy the note, you buy the mortgage from that local or regional bank or credit union for 1.5 million. You go to the seller, you're trying to be the nice guy. You go to the actual operator, I mean, and you say, hey, I'm willing to work with you. If you can pay off this note in nine months or whatever as planned, 
you can pay off you can pay off 2.2 million we'll call it even in other words you're giving them a huge discount to make it work for them but if they if they can make it work great you just made seven hundred thousand dollar profit about almost 50 percent profit in about a year if it doesn't work you have to foreclose well if you foreclose you get a three million dollar apartment complex for one and a half million this is how Howard Marks has made a fortune for Oak Tree Capital. And you can do it too. I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying you'll, you know, won't be there. There'll be a lot of people competing for these. But if you know these cycles, if you understand how cycles work, you will have a chance to invest in these types of things. So, um, Cami, welcome, Cami. We're newbies trying to find a hard money lender, but finding difficult due to our lack of experience. Any suggestions? Yeah, Cami. I, I'm honestly, I would just say this is an easy answer. Skip the hard money. Go straight to the lease option sandwich. You will need virtually no. You won't need to get a loan. You'll be able to use the existing loan from the seller, and you'll be able to work it out that way. Again, I mentioned it twice earlier. Uh, Real Estate on Your Terms is a book by Chris Prefontaine that describes that in detail. So, Cami, best of luck to you. Thanks for joining today. What else do we have? Um, Al's, Al's Shep Dog, usually a 10-year cycle top to top for there for a four to five-year bottom of cycle. Okay. Um, 10 years is a fairly common cycle, but um, it is. You know, uh, it, it takes four years, two to three to four years to get to the bottom alone. And so, um, you know, we don't know if this will be a U-shaped, V-shaped, W-shaped, or L-shaped recession. Those are all possibilities. V-shaped is the one we all hope for. L-shaped is the one we all dread. But it's likely we're going to be U-shaped, according to many people, which is a bathtub-shaped recession. You slide in. And then you kind of bump along the bottom. It's really painful. There's rocks down there. And then you eventually get out of the recession. That's what most people that I'm hearing from think is going to happen. Um, I can see if I can pull up the picture of that U-shaped recession here, Nikki, but not, not there yet. So um, hold on a second. Uh, I don't think I have it handy, do I? Yes. Okay, here we go. So this is a V-shaped recession. And um, sorry about the... Okay. So this is a V-shaped recession. And this is what we all hope for. This is a U-shaped recession. This is what many people expect. That's also the bathtub recession. This is the W-shaped recession, which th there's a reason to believe this could happen. There could be euphoria later this summer when people can travel and go to hotels and go on cruises again and then the real pain kicks in and then there's another down downer there, this happened in 80 and 82 and then the dreaded japanese or l-shaped recession which means you go down and there's a long very slow climb back out so okay thanks nikki so um where are we in the questions? I missed one that Nikki posted and I wanna get that. By the way, it's five minutes till the top of the hour. You guys have been so kind, so patient with me with my internet problems today. Thank you for hanging in there and I'm really glad that you made it. I'm honored to be here and I'm so happy that I get to do this. I'm amazed that I get to do this and I'm amazed that all of you are, um, uh, showing up today. So thank you so much. So Cammy, I think I answered your question. Thank you. So uh, Jazraj Singh Tukre says, is it a good time to invest in real estate during a recession or should I wait a year to invest during the recovery? Um, you know, I would say it's a great, the best time to invest by far is as close as you can get to the bottom of a recession. And I think we're one to two years away from that. Um, and so let's take a look at, you know, maybe trying to get your cash, get your people, get your experience, get your training in and be ready to do that. Someone asked, what is a HELOC? A HELOC is a home equity line of credit 
I highly recommend that you get a home equity line of credit as your first loan on your house. If you haven't heard about that, you can go to replaceyourmortgage.com, I think it's called, or VIP Financial Education on YouTube, and you can learn a lot more about that. Um, home equity line of credit has some incredible advantages, uh, which I don't have time to get into now, but it's my one of my favorite strategies for investing in real estate because you have access to the cash equity in your home, but you don't grab it until you need it. And so it's one of the ways I like to invest. So in the last three minutes, we're going to do rapid fire, see how many questions I can get in. Gino Juliana says, isn't the current real estate environment different from that of 2008, given the last crash was tied to mortgage-backed securities? Absolutely. Single family uh, home demand is high and, and supply is low, right? Yes, that's absolutely true. And that's why single family home rentals are going to do well, Gino, in this upcoming uh, situation we're in. It is different, but the unemployment is so massive and so unprecedented that I think it's going to be, I personally think it's going to be as bad or worse, just different. And we're not sure in what ways yet. Cammy says, okay, so I answered Cammy's question already. Uh, I would recommend that you, you know, Cammy, that you really seriously try to um, use the lease option sandwich strategy instead of hard money. Uh, Mr. McAmill says, can you get a HELOC on rental properties? You can, you for sure can. Um, you're going to want to look long and hard, and especially at local, regional, or community banks or credit unions for that. Um, Derek Clifford says, what do you think about shifting to section eight on rentals during this time? You know, section eight, Derek has been something a lot of people didn't like even hated over these last couple of years, but now is a great time to be in section eight since the government is still printing money. They're still open for business and you're still going to get your rent paid. So I think section eight, at least at this moment is a great opportunity opportunity. Um, Leon Harvey says, is it too early to cash out your HELOC before bank freezing HELOC accounts? Yeah. So Leon, there's there's a, a lot of word on the street out there that the banks are going to freeze HELOCs, home equity line of credits. And so for the people who think that's going to happen, you should probably jump, grab all the cash out of your HELOC that you can and move it to another account. This is not dishonest. This is just you using the cash that you agreed to use. And then if they freeze out your HELOC, it's more likely that they won't touch yours if you've already got money. And if they do, and if they make you repay, let's say it's $50,000, then you have the 50,000 in another account, but you also have it ready to invest in real estate. If not, they don't want your house back. Trust me, they should want to work with you. Alvaro says, where do you recommend us getting more educated on this? Alvaro, if you could please quickly tell me what this is, um, I will try my very best to answer that. All Shep Dog says, what is Section 8? That's government paid housing, or at least it's um, partially paid by the government for low-income families. There's a lot of challenges with it, but it's something that uh, I recommend that people look at right now. Unemployment is mostly temporary, unlike typical recession, Jerry says. Uh, Jerry, you know, I've been wanting to believe that for the last couple months, but I'm now hearing about businesses that are shutting down permanently. They're just throwing in the towel. And it's tragic to think for all these people who spent 30, 40 years and were ready to retire this year or next year, and them seeing everything they worked for evaporated. And I, I hate that, but it is just a fact of what's happening. So Jerry, I wanna believe this unemployment is temporary, but I have to believe it is not just temporary. A lot of it is. Sure, airlines are gonna be back in business soon. Hopefully hotels will be, but there's gonna be a lot of places that have taken such hits that they're not gonna be back in business. And that's what I'm seeing. Mark Brown says, what do you think the downstream effects will be on New York City real estate, seeing as their market will take longer to recover than others around the U.S.? 
Mark, that is a really good question. Here's what I'll say. There are certain gateway cities, Boston, New York, LA, San Francisco, and Chicago specifically, uh, that are always recover. They always come back. They all, they, they're, they're so internationally popular that they're going to come back. And uh, I think that you can bet that they are going to come back as well. As far as timing, I don't know, Mark. That's a really good question. There's so much we don't know, and we don't know what we don't know. The Capricorn Way says, how do you invest in self-storage? You can acquire your own self-storage. You can invest with friends. You can actually invest in a self-storage REIT. You, if you're a credited investor, you can invest in funds or syndications. Uh, you can pull together friends and buy. Uh, James MacAndrew was on here earlier. James has some self-storage. I know he's trying to sell or wholesale. So you can also join Scott Myers. That's M-E-Y-E-R-S. He's a bigger pockets contributor. Um, his self-storage facility. So last question of the day, Alvaro says, Paul, I don't have a lot of experience and I would like to get more education on real estate investment. You are in the right place, Alvaro, because Bigger Pockets is your source for real estate investing, education, community. There's lots of books here. There's lots of free information. There's uh, thousands and thousands of forum posts. Bigger Pockets is the place to go. My wife is going to be mad that I wore this hat, but I'm advertising Bigger Pockets. My favorite place, the smartest thing I ever did was get involved in Bigger Pockets. Getting a pro membership made it even better, and I highly recommend you take advantage of that, Alvaro. There's lots of great books, depending on where you want to be. This is the best time in history to prepare quickly to be involved in real estate investing, and I highly recommend that you uh, you jump in right now. DL says, what about my question? DL, I missed your question. I'm so sorry. But if anybody wants to private message me, um, I will try to answer your question. James McAndrew says, here's where you can reach me. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate all you. Appreciate you, Nikki. Appreciate you, Bigger Pockets. Thanks to my family for letting me do this on a Saturday. And thanks to all of you. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and healthy.